Welcome to the Access Sport Podcast, your best chance to learn more about our students, our teams and our programmes. Hello everyone, welcome to the latest episode of the Access Sport Podcast. I always cringe when I hear that little intro that I made. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible voice at the start. Uh, myself, Gary Judd, Director at Access Sport and we've got to my right, left, what are we looking at? <laughs> I don't know how we're looking at it, but yeah, Jordan Neil. So I run the well, the lead for careers and pastoral at XS Sport as well. So yeah, happy to be here again for another week. And we're joined, delighted to be joined by James Gow. So James, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk through all of James's achievements. That's his job today. But his latest role has been as a football technical director. So a lot of our staff and our students will be very interested in one. I guess what that. That job entails, but also, which is more important for, for these types of episodes, it's it's all about your journey, James, how you got to where you, you are now. I'm going to probably allow Jordan to ask the first question, but before we do, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Gary and Jordan. Looking forward to uh, to chatting with you. So, James, just obviously going right back to the start, um, where did your journey in football start? Um, I suppose I, I, I've always loved football. And uh, I remember going to my first Liverpool match, I'm a massive Liverpool fan, my first Liverpool match when I think I was four years old, Robbie Fowler scored at Atrich for, I think it was against, oh, I think he scored four goals against Middlesbrough and Liverpool won 5-0 or 5-1. And uh, so I remember going to the match the first time and just being obsessed with football after that. Um, always played at a, a decent level, school football and um, went into a couple of clubs, but it wasn't probably wasn't quite good enough. 16, 17, played for a semi-pro club, Prescott Cables, uh, and then started coaching as a volunteer with Liverpool's um, community programme, coaching kids and adults with disabilities. I think it was about 16. I did that for about four years, and, and I loved it. I just loved being on the pitch, loved interacting with people, loved planning sessions and seeing people get better. Um so that gave me a bit of a, a, a thought to think. Well, if I can, if I can do that as a volunteer, in a voluntary capacity, could I could I make a career out of it? And um, decided to go to uni and study at Liverpool John Moores, and I did a, a degree called uh, Science and Football as an as an undergraduate. And at the same time, started doing my coaching badges. Something actually Gary helped me with. What well, about 16, 17 years ago on me on me level two. Um, and as I, as I was doing that, I went to do my B licence whilst I was studying and also started as an intern at Liverpool, um, as a performance analyst intern at Liverpool, working with the first team and the academy. So I, I suppose when when I was about 16 to 21, I was just trying to gobble up as much experience as possible, do as many different things as possible. So I was coaching in the community programme. I started doing a little bit of coaching with the county FA Um and I was also doing my internship at Liverpool. So it, it gave me, uh, I suppose, a range, a varied range of different ways that you could work in football, professional community, as a volunteer. Um, and, and that was probably the, me as a young individual, that was where I really got into football. I mean, I mean, you, you touched on a few things there, but just to, just to pick a few bits out, the, the first one is volunteering. I mean, it, it seems to be something that's... Um, Disappearing from the the mindset of a lot of young people, uh, you know, of recent years, it, it seems to be that people don't want to give up the time and don't see the value in giving up the time unless they're being paid. Talk to us a little bit more about how important that that volunteering aspect of you know was to your to your journey and your you know your career. I think you'd be insane to turn down voluntary work because every hour that you put in is is you harnessing your craft, is you perfecting your craft. And you can't you can't take hours out of the learning process. So as a young individual, you think you know so much about football, whereas in reality you know very little. And in order to build up your knowledge and keep learning, you've got to go out and experience different things. And and if you can give yourself, I think at a young age you need to give yourself such a broad range of experience. So if people ask you to come to a session, go and do a session. If people ask you to come in and film sessions. Go and do it. And I think it hits many different things, Gary, because it doesn't just mean that you're getting better at your craft, but also you start to build a network of, of people and you don't know where people go and you don't know which people want to 
will want you to go with them because if you're if you're giving up your time to help somebody out, generally that's reciprocated down the line. And you know, it might be a year, it might be a month, it might be three, four years. It actually comes back around. I often find, and uh, people go, "Hang on, you know, I remember James," and and they know your face, and they go, "Well, I'm appointing for this position." And, and and you go and put in for that position. They're, they're interviewing you. They know your face. They can trust you. They've seen it. You've done before. I think it's so important. I think it would be insane not to take as much voluntary work as possible if if you're really serious about trying to work in football. Because the one thing I say is it's so competitive, like unbelievably competitive. So what's going to differentiate you from somebody else? And the thing that generally differentiates you is your experiences in the environment. So it's not necessarily just that you say you've got your A levels or just that you've got your B tech or just that you've got your degree. What what are you doing alongside that to take all that knowledge and that theory and put it into practice? And by being a volunteer, you get to work out what are you, what do you like? You know, I, I knew when I was a volunteer as a coach, that's what I loved. But I also knew when I was a volunteer as an analyst that it wasn't necessarily for me. I enjoyed the internship and I learned so many things from that that helped me in my coaching. But it also made me go, hang on, this isn't where you want to be going down. You want to be going more down the coaching route. And it, and it gives you that understanding. Just to stick on the, the volunteering, James, like not to jump ahead in your journey, but now you reach the level that you're at now. If, if a coach was to come to you like a young coach and, and sort of looking for a role, how much do you value as a as like not an employer, but someone who's given sort of positions away. How much do you value, like, volunteer work? Massively. You know, I had, I'll, I'll tell you the story. So my my, my last role was with, with Al Jazeera in the UAE. Um, and big, big club, you know, we had a big operation. I was overseeing 100, 150 staff, 1,000 players across three sites. And one of my big objectives was to bring in volunteers with the idea of putting them on permanent contracts the following season and we actually brought in last season six volunteers every single one of them got a contract this year um, and I did that again this season brought in volunteers with the idea of giving them and hopefully the club will still do that next season for them is give them a contract next season so for me it's massive because you need people to carry that burden of, of, of the work you need people that are interested and committed the one thing about being a volunteer it shows intent shows pure intent you know, I want to be involved in this. I'm sacrificing other things. I'm giving up time. I'm giving up social time. I'm giving up potentially even working more hours, which gets you more money. It shows a clear intent that this is something I really want. And it puts you in the limelight in front of people. So for me, I value it massively, massively. I think that's really important to hear because I think essentially when you're you know, around 16 or whatever, I don't think you actually appreciate what it does for you down the line. It's so hard to understand that you're putting in work now and it's sort of planting the seeds. You're not going to reap the rewards for maybe five, you know, two, five, ten years or whatever it is. But it's just that shift in mentality to know that you have to, you know, the work you put in now will pay off. And I think, you know, learners, parents or, or you know, even people involved with access hearing that from, from someone like you, I think that's very important. Just an, just another thing as well to, to try and balance it up. But we're obviously in a, a difficult economic climate, you know. Where and, and in fairness to a lot of the learners, they're under pressure to work. But I think I think balance is, is very important there. You know, you, you touched on it then, Jay. That there'll be times when they may be turned down paid work, whether it be in a supermarket or a pub or whatever it be, to go and do some volunteering. It's possible to get that balance. Is it? I'm pretty sure when you were in uni that you were you were do you know you were working in, in other in other roles outside of football. And they, they play an important part, I think, for me and, and everyone's journey as well, of, of just kind of getting to know a general working environment, understanding structure and, and working under managers and things like that. Definitely. You know, your, your time's valuable, isn't it? And I suppose if, you, if you're really intent on working in football, you have to weigh it up. You know, what, if I'm working in a bar or a supermarket, whatever it may be, OK, great. But I'm guessing that's not your long-term ambition. Your long-term ambition is to work in football. So you're going to have to sacrifice something to get to where you want to be. But you, the good thing is you get to pick that, you know. And I think at a young age, you you, you have you might have to sacrifice other things. You might you, Maybe you do less hours and work, but maybe you also decide, well, actually, socially, I'm not going to do 
as much as I was previously. But you know what the end goal is, and the end goal is I want to work in football. And if you can keep that clear in your mind, every time you go out to be a volunteer, I used to see it as I'm one hour closer to being permanently in football or I'm one step closer, one session closer to working permanently in football because I think that's what it what, what it does for you. And it might be difficult to to kind of connect all of that when you're young and you're 16, 17 years old. You can't really see ahead. But then, like, for us who all worked in, in, in football at some level, you look back and you go, ah, it all makes sense because I was practising here. I, I got a good contact there. He took me to here. That took me up. And it starts to all make sense. It starts to connect all of the dots. Um, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't recommend that, that, that highly enough. And, and a broad, a really broad range of, of, of things. Don't turn stuff down, you know, whether... You know, someone says, do you want to come and coach the under-11 girls team or do you want to go and coach, you know, a community programme? Go and do it, you know, because it, it gives you the opportunity as well, I'd say, lads, to interact with different people. So the community stuff that clubs do are brilliant because, you know, I was, I think, 18 years old and I was working in with kids and adults with disabilities through a few days a week. I'd be in the academy a couple of days a week, I'd be with the first team a couple of days a week, and then I'd be going to underprivileged areas in the city, working with um, kids and putting on coaching sessions for kids with Liverpool and Everton's Kicks programme. So in, in the space of a week, you're getting to see four different environments. You're interacting with four different types of people. So as a communicator, I think, which is a massive skill for anyone in any walk of life, especially coaching, or especially working in football, you've got to be able to communicate. It gives you that, it gives you that skill. It helps you, it helps you develop that skill. I think the environment one's a massive one, mate, particularly in, in coaching football, as you say. It it not just it doesn't just take place in, in various different locations, as we're obviously gonna discover here. It's all it's always it's also about the, you know, if you like the consumer on the end of it. As you say, you've worked with, with learners or with, with, with people with disabilities, you've worked with older older people, with younger people, you know, you've worked in schools in school environments, I'm assuming, you've worked in academy environments. It's such a wide spectrum, isn't it, of of different, you know, different aspects of coaching as well that that, that exists. A million percent. There's, there's, and I think the, the the sole thing is you, you're trying to help somebody else get better, you know. So I, I I enjoy coaching the kids and adults with disabilities just as much as I did actually coaching kids who were really talented in an academy, you know. And and I, I was lucky enough, and you I think you know him, Gary. We had the coach at Liverpool called Michael Beale. Yeah. Um, yeah. he's now manager of QPR Michael Beale when he was coaching I think under 23s at Liverpool he was telling me I'm going to start coaching in Liverpool's community programme as well because it gives me a different skill and you think well this guy's now working at the top level as a manager and he's even even whilst he's doing working with elite players he's still got the appetite to do that as well and I think it does give you the ground and it gives you a different perspective. It gives you different ways to communicate, and that all helps you. That all helps you in your in your coaching. I think the importance of that there, though, is, is also what it does for life skills. Because as you say, like that's somebody who you know, touching on Michael Beale, who might be have ambition to be at a certain level or be in a certain environment, but he understands maybe putting himself outside of his comfort zone a little bit. What that would do for him as a person and as a coach, and I think. Especially in the in the modern world we're in, I think it's a little bit it's a little bit more difficult. But I think rounding out these as as a coach, you don't really appreciate what you're doing for your life skills until obviously again, like I mentioned earlier, until you're a little bit older. But I think all of this is sometimes it, it's hard not it's hard to see this as a younger person. But I think you know the proof is in the pudding, um, and I think you know developing your life skills as well as developing what you would consider your passion. It, it again, as you to to Robert Fraser, you've just said it. It's a no-brainer. Mm. You, you know what, Jordan? I think you're totally right because all of this stuff with it's great coaching football, but then when you've got to turn up and put on a session in front of people, that's daunting. You know what I mean? So, but fast forward a few years, you're going to have to turn up in front of somebody else, tell them why you should be put in place for that job and why they should pay you a certain amount of money. And you start to become comfortable with that at a young age if you're willing to throw yourself out into, into difficult situations. I, I remember um, I remember coaching Liverpool's under-12s. I was working as a volunteer for Barry Lutus, 
uh, was the 23s coach. Now Barry was under 12s coach, and he was he was he was coaching another age group for a few days. And um, some club said to me, "You're going to have to coach them for the next few days." And I was on the the Astor turf outside the no. academy. Yeah, and it's got a, it's got a balcony there, and I was coaching. I think the under 12s or 13s it was, and it was all the academy management was stood because they used to go out onto the onto the onto the veranda there onto the balcony and just watch the training sessions, and they were flapping it massively, thinking you know I'm, I'm doing a session. All these people are watching, but brilliant because I was under pressure. I had to try and do a good job. I had to deal with feeling uncomfortable and getting over that. And that meant that the next time I was more comfortable. And then because the next time I was more comfortable, I did a better job. So I think you'd have to be really open with the idea that it might be a daunting experience. You might have to look a little bit daft at times and a bit stupid. But when you do that, you're going to improve yourself. And then you're, you're going to, it's going to work out down the line because you're going to, you're going to be in a much better position. You're going to be better at what you do. Just, just one, just one thing on that. It's a really good point because there's a, there's a word that's used a lot in society at the moment, and it's, it's often used in a, in a negative light, and that word's anxiety. What you, you're talking about there is anxiety, extreme anxiety probably at that moment when you realise, you know, all of your seniors and, and well-respected managers and coaches and, and people who, who may be responsible for shaping your career are all watching you at one given time. That's, that's, that's difficult, isn't it? But that skill, as you've said, to try and overcome that, come through it and then take it as a valuable experience it's something I think that a lot of our learners now see as it's always a negative if you get put under pressure or you feel, you know, really anxious. If that if that's the case, Gary, don't work in football. You know, <laughs> honestly, because if you're not comfortable with feeling uncomfortable and you're not comfortable with confronting anxiety, don't work in football because it's not for you. Because there will be, whatever level you want to work at, you're going to have anxiety and you're going to, but. You've got to then think of the bigger picture. I always think because I'm not I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so you know. But the state and the straight anxiety, right? So state anxiety is the anxiety that you're given in the moment, right? So if you if you say to me, James, go out and talk in front of fifty thousand people, that state that you're putting me in, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel anxious, and because I haven't faced that situation where I've spoken. Unless you've got fifty thousand people on this podcast. <laughs> Would you mind to? Oh well, I'm not gonna. I, I, I'm not gonna be prepared for that, right? The way that I do become prepared for that is that I confront it in a small way. I go right. I'm gonna go and talk in front of ten people. Then I'm gonna call, I'm gonna feel uncomfortable, but I'm gonna just stretch myself a little bit. Then I'm gonna talk in front of hundred people and can and so on and so forth until you reach that number. But you have to feel comfortable with the idea that I can deal with that state and that that particular thing you're going to put me in and if you don't feel comfortable with with doing that you don't feel comfortable with being anxious in the moment and thinking bigger picture because if you zoom out and you think well this this me feeling anxious for this one hour putting a training session not going to ruin my life but if i if i can deal with it and willing to deal with it it might take me one step closer to where to where i want to go so I think you've got to be. You've got to confront that. You you can't get away from that. You have to confront it. I think I think you're right as well. The power of putting it into context. Absolutely. I think that's that's a that's a really really decent coping mechanism. I think for a lot of them out there. I'm just going to come away from this slightly. That was I enjoyed that. Really got in quite deep on anxiety, which is always always a good thing for for the, for our younger listeners. Um, just just going back a little bit to you, you, you touched at the start about, you know, you played a little bit of football. By the sounds of it, you played at a similar level to me and Jordan. And, you know, you'd always had them aspirations to kick on. It never quite happened for you. A lot of our students will be sitting here now in that position where, you know, they may be playing some semi-pro footy or they're on the cusp of that or they've, they've had a knockback from academies at 15, 16. They're still trying to climb that ladder. At what point, and I'm not going to ask you to advise them right now, I'm just going to get you to think back a little bit. At what point did you make that decision to go, I'm not a footballer now. I'm now going to commit myself to coaching. And why? Why? And what was it that made you do that? Um, probably when I was about 18, 17, 18, I had a couple of opportunities to go and play in America. And I actually was coaching in America for three months doing uh, soccer camps with, with Challenger football camps. And I went to see a few of the unis and I still had in the back of my mind this idea that 
don't go to uni, you can do well here, you never know what it leads to. Um, and I went to see the, the a couple of colleges in America whilst I was there coaching. And the seasons are only really short in America. And I just started my internship or starting an internship at Liverpool. And I thought, you know what? It's for me, not that the penny dropped, I don't want to say that, but it was like, I've got more chance of a career doing this than I have as a player. And I'd already, through my voluntary work, understood that I had a massive passion for coaching as well. It wasn't just a passion just as a player. I think it's... I actually think that's important even for professional players now is that they don't just have one passion. You know, if you have one passion and it's only football, it's not always going to be there. You don't know when it's going to going to finish. So you want to have multiple passions and that, that, that usually means you can be better than the one thing that you're most passionate about. So I think it was about 18, the penny. That, that, that was the moment where I thought, no, I, I'm really serious about what I want to do. I've got my internship at Liverpool. I'm going to start Union John Moores. And that's that's going to be me full throttle on that. Brilliant. It's, brave, it's a brave decision to make. Well, you know, it is a brave decision to make at, at such an age. But do you think being sort of exposed, as we mentioned, being exposed to... Because I don't think, when I think back to players I played with, and even myself, I was never exposed to coaching, so to speak. Do you think you had a benefit from, you know, you know playing, but also coaching at the same time? So you'd had that sort of wide spectrum of... of sort of both sides of the coin. Yeah, I think it help I, I think it actually helps you as a player. In fact, mm. it definitely will help you as a player because you'll communicate better number one. And if you can't communicate on a football pitch, you shouldn't be on there. So you should, you know, you'll communicate better with your teammates. You'll also, I think, see the game from a different perspective because you then start to realise, oh, if I press the ball like this, it might be better. And I can guide my teammates on that, or you know, if I make this movement, it'll be better, or use this type of touch. I, I was probably the same as you, Jordan. It wasn't until I was about 15, I think, I went to Chester and got coached by a coach then. Before that, it was school and mm-hmm. Sunday league. And I, I, I always wish, and for everyone does, that I had better coaching at a young, much younger age. But I never. It was when I be, actually started coaching myself where things started to make a lot more sense. But I, when I was a player, I used to just run all over the place. I didn't have a clue about positioning. I didn't. I honestly didn't have a clue. But then, I, then I started to understand. Actually, well, you need to start staying in the centre of the pitch. You need to start moving here when the ball's there. I wouldn't have seen that from just the vision of being on the pitch and being a player. It was only yeah. when you step out as a coach that you can see that. I think. I think sometimes you know, young footballers especially will see it as. They see it as exclusives, don't they? They see it as like, I can't go and be a coach because that means I can't be a player. But up to a certain age and to a certain standard, you can see, you can see both sides, and there's definitely a there's definitely a benefit. I I mean, I, I wish I'd done it. Um I was of the other way where I was like, you know, I just want to play. But a good friend of mine who I went to university with for the last two years of our university degree, he coached and played, and he now he's now on sort of coaching staff and at elite football. And I just yeah. think there's so much just opening your mind a little bit and understanding that there is different ways into the game is such an important it's it's such an important thing because I think yeah. sometimes young people especially will get bogged down with just want to be a player, just want to be a player. And I think that's not not always the right way to look at it. No, and, and look, I mean, you don't want to quash anybody's dream because there are players who make it mm. late, but at the same time. There's, there's a part of you goes, well, you know that the percentages are really small. You know, the chances of being a player are really small. So don't be that one person who's only going to put everything into being a player and not have a fallback option. Because I also think that if, if, if you've got another option, it broadens what... It, it, it actually helps you in your passion of being a player. Because it makes you more comfortable. Not everything's riding on it. Whereas everything's riding on being a player, then that that would make me feel anxious. You know that that if that if my whole identity and everything I had to do was about being a football player, that make me anxious because it's not within my control. But if I had something else and I go, well, I'm going to put loads into this, but I've got something else. If it doesn't work, I mean, life's not going to fall apart. So I'm put, you know, it's 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 important to, to I think to broaden. What you do as a young person. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah, I could, couldn't agree more, mate. Well, listen, as I said, I said, I said this on our, our last few episodes. We try and keep them to thirty minutes. So I'm going to give you a couple more questions to finish us off. Um, we, we've we've obviously got students, as we've referred to quite a lot, listening to this. We'll also have st- st- some staff and parents listening. What what advice would you give to I guess those those different groups in terms of? I'll start with the the, the staff really first. Working with young people who have got as we've talked about, those mixed aspirations, some looking at to go into to coaching, some into sports science, all still maybe harbouring a little bit of a, um ambition to still stay in the game. What advice would you give to them? So thinking about it from a staff point of view first, as in put James Gow in the position of being a teacher or a coach for a minute. And then to the parents who are, who are looking at, you know, their their sons or daughters' futures, what the, you know, the next steps they're going to take, college, uni, etc. What advice would you give to them? Um, for staff, so this is staff who are working with the young players, Gary. Yeah, yeah working with our students now, yeah. I would say um, if they've got aspirations of working somewhere else, then it's probably the same pathway, just a little bit further along the line than the students, is go and offer your services to a, a football club and say, would you take me in for two nights a week or three nights a week? So I can see what your sports scientist does, for example, um, because you've got to get exposure to that world to know whether that's actually something that you want. Get in touch with people on LinkedIn. I have people get in touch with me on LinkedIn every day of the week, mm-hmm. and I, I have I actually quite like talking to people. So you know, if, if somebody messaged me, the lad just messaged me today and said, "Look, I want to work in the Middle East. Can I chat with you?" For me, no problem. You know, if you can if you can help someone on that, because I also would hope that. If I'm going to message somebody at some point, which, which you know, definitely will, I'll reach out to people. I hope they reciprocate, you know, and they say, look, I can give you half an hour of my time, sure, to talk. I'll advocate that, by the way, just for the benefit of everyone else. We probably, I probably give Jay two hours' notice about this, message him on LinkedIn, and then he mm-hmm. reminds me that I actually has his number, and, and we literally saw us that in two hours, so he's not, he's not chatting on, he's not chatting on that. <laughs> on that. <laughs> but I think... <laughs> You do oh, get inundated now as well, Jay, by yeah. after staff and parents. No, but it's, it, I think it's a, you know, and again, it strengthens one thing in, in, in any walk of life is important is your network, you know, and, and if you think of people, you don't know what comes of that. You know, my job here in, in Al Jazeera, it was the biggest job I've ever had and I wasn't expecting it this, this, this early. And it was because I was living in China, I was working there, and somebody put me in touch with a guy called Mass Davidson. And Mass is now one of the most well-known sport directors around. And Mass and I, I, I reached out to Mass and said, would you, would you catch up uh, and have a chat? So I actually flew to where he was in China to have a bite to eat with him. And we stayed friendly, only on a professional capacity for probably seven, eight years. And it was only seven, eight years later, Mass called me and said, look, I'm at Al Jazeera. I think you, you're ready for this role. That would never have happened if I never reached out to Mass and Mass wasn't good enough to me to say, yeah, come and have a, have a bite to eat, have a coffee. And it's, it, again, probably one of them things where you can't connect the dots moving forward, but moving backwards, you, you can. Hmm. Well, on think, that, uh, go on, Jordan. Sorry, sorry yeah, I think the power of networking is such a is such an accessible tool now in, in the modern day as well. And I think... It's you know we put we are pushing LinkedIn hugely as a college and I think you know back in the day networking was obviously being out and as you just touched on then you might have to fly somewhere you might have to travel somewhere but now we sort of have it on a computer on a phone and yes it's not going to take you to directly into into roles but it definitely does the hard yards for you you know you have names of people you might be able to you know politely introduce yourself or get involved in conversations or whatever it might be and I think. For now, it's such a LinkedIn's obviously a free platform to a certain point, to the point that you need it. I think the access of having something so free and so accessible is just the tool that you, as a as a professional, you know, I'm sure there's people 10, 15, 20 years ago who would have, you know, killed to have this. So I think it's so it's so so important to obviously build yourself a good network, and you can do that from a very young age now, which is even more important. And I, th- I think it's important that. You reach out to people with genuine intentions, though. Yeah. You don't reach out to them and send them a generic message. Like, you know, you've got to have something ready for them to say, listen, 
I understand your time's really busy. I, I, I genuinely appreciate it. You can give me 15 minutes. I'd love to pick your brains because I think sometimes I, I look at my messages and think, well, that's just a generic message. You haven't got my name right. You know what I mean? So then I go, well, I'm, I'm not even going to go. I'm not going to message any. I'm not going to reply to him on that one. But other people who send you the kind of genuine, authentic message, you go, yeah, I'll, I'll give them yeah. whatever time they need. Class, well, as Jordan just said, then we are we are really pushing LinkedIn massively, particularly with the students, and some of them already this year have done some some great work. And one of the things we're trying to do, which connects a lot of the stuff stuff we've spoke about in, in this call, is is to is to promote the volunteer work they're doing, any of the stuff they're doing in college, which which illustrates the experiences they're getting. Because I'm sure you'll say, as as an employer, Jay, you know that if you're looking to employ someone, going through their LinkedIn and maybe seeing the stuff they've done over the last. 12, 24 months, 36 months, it, it paints a picture, doesn't it? A million percent. It gives you an insight, a, a window into what they're like as a person, you know, and if, you, if you're putting stuff up frequently and you're showing that you're active and you're showing... It, if, if I don't see that, then you don't know anything about that person. So yeah. you, you're going in on a whim, whereas if you do have that content up, it gives you an insight into what that, that person is like, you know? Um uh, the other question you had, Gary, was around parents. What would I do? How would I advise parents? I always think I'm not a parent, so it's hard for me to, to say that because, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, so you've had kids, you don't realise. I can only speak from the experience of working with football, young footballers and communicating with their parents is that generally I see the players that do best are the ones whose parents engage in an optimum amount, and that's difficult to, to gauge because if you say on one end of the spectrum, there's no contact from the parents, and on the under, other end of the spectrum, there's too much contact where they're calling you all the time. Neither of them are a good thing. It's probably somewhere in the middle where you say that's probably the... Pro and In fact, I say somewhere in the middle, somewhere closer to the end where you let the staff get on with their job and guide them because... You know, we've all took a lot of time to do our qualifications, build our experience, and we like to think that we know what we're doing. And if the parents done their homework properly, they've sent them to a place where, that they trust. And if you trust that place, let us get on with the job. Um, because, you know, if, if they're a chef, you don't go into their kitchen and tell them how to cook and, and cut, cut up vegetables. You don't. So you've got to, you've got to allow... That's probably a bit of what we spoke, spoke about at the start about feeling uncomfortable that somebody else is looking after the next phase of their son's or daughter's journey. But I, I, I'd look at it that is, don't be a helicopter parents where they follow. I had, a, I had a player at the academy recently and his dad would just follow his son to every single part of the pitch. I said to him, listen, you're going to have to stop doing that because he's going to become overly reliant on you. If he becomes overly reliant on you, what happens when he goes in for the job? You're not going to go in and do the job interview for him. So, so let him get on with it and, get, and and do his skill himself. And I think as a parent, it can be a little bit hard to kind of separate that and allow them to go and do it. So, uh, you know, maintain contact, but let the experts get on with the job. Yeah, I, th I think there's three Absolutely. things Three things for me there, mate, that are, that are spot on. What, the first one is homework. We say to all of our parents, look, go and do your homework. There's lots of different choices out there in terms of, next steps for your you know for your boys or your girls go and do that first the second one is trust I, I completely advocate that if you've done your homework and you're happy with your your choice that you and your son or daughter has made then trust us with that but then the third one is is promoting that independence is making sure that your young people are then accountable for their actions if they're late make them accountable you know if they're not they're not pulling their weight in in, in training or in lessons make them accountable don't try and make up excuses for them and and that's sometimes a frustration for me. And look, sometimes there are valid excuses and I'm not, and I'm a parent. And sometimes I will try and come up with an excuse maybe for my son or daughter, but I'll only do it if I think it's valid and I think it's something that, you know, is going to support them in their long-term journey and not, and not something that's going to kind of give them somewhere to hide. Yeah. You know what? I think that, that last one, Gary, where you talk about responsibility, that is incredibly important because... If you can be a, a person who, who is, if you're happy to demonstrate that you're responsible for everything, whether you've done something good or whether you've not been pulling your weight, you've not been turning up on time, take responsibility for it because it's such an important thing to do because 
It then, if you don't take responsibility, well, how are you ever going to change it? And if you don't make your son or daughter responsible for their actions, how are they ever going to change it? Because if you're being told you're not going in the direction that you should be right now, the only person that can change it is them as an individual. And if you're not allowing them to do that, then they'll never go to where they need to be. So you have to give them that, that responsibility to go and take care of it. All right, if they're going off a little bit, tell them. But again, it's your responsibility to change it. You know, if I, I used to be late for college all the time, right? Because I didn't get out of bed early enough to, to, to get the bus. And it was only a couple of months in where I was blaming the bus. My dad said, pull your head in. What are you talking about? It's not the bus. The bus wasn't late. It was me who was late. And it was that moment where I was like, hang on, yeah. I've got to change this. I've just got to get up an hour earlier and make, just make sure I get the bus. It was nobody else's fault. It was my fault. But if I didn't take responsibility for that in that moment, I, w- I would never have gone to college. It would have been, it would have just, it would never have changed. So I think allowing them to take responsibility and actually saying, by the way, you're not perfect, you know, because if you want to go to where you want to go and, you know, whatever, say professional football is a goal for lots of people, I guess. If you want to work in professional football, you're not ready now. But the only way you're ready is if you accept that you're not quite there. You're going to have to accept your faults. You accept your areas where you're weak and develop them. And only you can do that as a person. Yeah, it's been a it's been a really interesting chat. I think the one thing that I've taken from from today is just the parallels between sport and life. Like this, they, they they run alongside each other, and everything that you're developing, you know, as 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 a player or someone who's involved in sport, you can easily switch that over to whichever direction you want to go in life. I mean, I know for myself, like I sort of work in a different industry than sport now, but I use so much that I learned in sport from playing, from falling out of the game. And I, and I still use it to this day, and I use it in a positive light. And I think, you know, if any sort of students are listening to this, everything you do on a pitch as a coach, you know, if we've got some students who do sort of, who are already trying to move into physio and stuff, anything you do now will also reflect directly in your life. And I think that's something that to really keep a hold of because it's so important. 100%. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take responsibility for going over time, Jay. I did say half an hour. We've now gone 37 minutes, so apologies on that one. Um, listen, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. It's a lot of valuable stuff come out there. No, I appreciate it. it was good chatting with you. Thanks, lads. Cheers, and uh, just one, just one last one. Obviously, any of the students that are on LinkedIn, James is on there. Connect with him. You know, sure. show him what you're about and stuff. Again, you never know your, your paths may cross in the future. But thanks again for your time, James, and uh, I'll catch you soon, mate. Thanks, lads. See you soon.